Alex, welcome to the Motormouth podcast. Right, let's go back a little bit. We always like to understand what shaped our guest and where they grew up, where was home, what was life like before you came into the spotlight. So tell us about your formative years. Where, where did Alex grow up? Well, number one, thanks for having me. Uh, and number two, I grew up in Ipswich in Suffolk and a uh, very normal upbringing, nice and fun, get on brilliantly with my parents. I'm an only child, so it was just us. Um, but it was football after school and that was sort of the world that, that orbited for a very long time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's a great town to grow up in. And this now reminds me because it wasn't long ago on social media that um, when Ipswich got promotion to the Premier League, you were hanging out with Ed Sheeran. Yeah, that is one of the strangest experiences I've ever had. He was there by chance, just playing a gig. Uh, that I think he'd agreed to, assuming that Ipswich weren't going to have their best season in 20 years. Uh, and then, strangely, there are three Ipswich fans in the paddock, in the F1 paddock, and we're all going way too over the top. Basically, I'm not saying we lost our heads, but a couple of them were wearing Ipswich shirts to work, which I think is getting close to losing your head. And then Ed Sheeran turns up on a Friday, which never happens on a Grand Prix weekend. Celebs never turn up on a Friday. Uh, and my colleague Nate went up to him and basically introduced himself and said, we're really Ipswich fans. And uh, and extraordinarily, uh, Ed Sheeran said, you want to come watch the game with me and my team? And so we did. And that was a fine way to spend a Saturday morning. Is he a nice bloke? He is remarkably normal for the success that he's had. Um, what was strange about that experience is that you normally get, you normally get, being in the paddock you come across a lot of big names and you meet them for maybe you know 30 seconds to five minutes maximum you never get to hang out with someone for three hours of an important game to him an important game to us I mean he's the club sponsor for goodness sake but he's also a childhood fan so when you've had 20 years of your team being rubbish and the butt of quite a lot of jokes and you know everyone up the road in Norwich has been having a good laugh at you it was quite important for everyone and then you're also hanging out with a. I think we all came out of the room going, well, I knew he's famous, but I didn't realise he was that famous because at one point he was like, you're right if I post this to my uh, Instagram account, it's 47 million followers. And you're like, what? It's insane. Absolutely crazy. What a load of fun. Now, football first. Ipswich, I know you're a big fan. So where did this interest and love for most sport and Formula One come from? This was flicking through the channels as a 10-year-old, bored on a Sunday afternoon, uh, it's so old ago, it's so long ago, there were only four channels that I had. I didn't have satellite TV. And on one of them was the Belgian Grand Prix of 1998. Murray Walker, Martin Brundle, they're in the middle of the red flag after that massive accident at the start. And I was hooked. It was like, I found it. I'd never seen it before. That was it. Uh, and I was instantly hooked. Now, there are a lot of people that are looking to get a career into most sport, broadcasting, journalism, wider media, and so on. How did your story start? What was your foot in the door? Um, the way that that worked was I always liked the idea of being in the world of media, but I loved the idea of being a commentator. Um, I came out of university. I'd done student, my student newspaper and my student radio station, but I'd not done any commentary at that point. And then happenstance, uh, there was a, it was a non-league football club that was looking for a, a club commentator. And so I started doing that. That then progressed into BBC local radio. And uh, I had a great sports editor at Radio Suffolk who lent me the equipment so I could go and work for other uh, radio stations. And so I became the go-to guy if they couldn't be bothered to send anyone. So if uh, BBC Radio Leeds couldn't be bothered to send anyone down south, they would turn to me. If BBC Radio Manchester couldn't be bothered to do the same thing, they'd turn to me. So uh, I, you're not making any money at this point, but I became the go-to guy to, to basically fill in if their main people couldn't do it. But when you get a big enough network of it, um, you end up getting, you know, work every weekend, as it were, even though, you know, as I said, it didn't really pay very much, but it gave me so much experience. So you'd say yes to every event possible, uh, and then you meet people in those press rooms. So you end up, uh, I met someone there who was part of a sports agency. And then I'm writing match reports, filming press conferences, doing uh, radio reports. Uh, and then that, that went on for a long time, uh, for about four years. Uh, and that was, that was mainly at the weekend, um, a little bit of midweek. And then at the same time, I was moving to a newspaper in London. 
Uh, and then Will Buxton wrote a blog saying he'd be giving up as Formula 2 commentator, GP2 at the time, but Formula 2 now. Um, and I sent the best of my work to the Formula 1 producers and they gave me an interview and then they gave me the job. It's an incredible story. And, and, and thanks to Will Buxton for giving you the, uh, the opportunity to get your foot through the door. Now, you've, yeah. you've covered Formula 1, Indy 500, 24 Hours of Le Mans, F2, F3, W Series, Porsche Super Cup, F1 Esports. I could go on. Is there a preference? I mean, obviously, Formula 1 is the pinnacle, the one everyone is sort of aiming for. But is that the most fun to call? Uh, I mean, Formula 2 has a really special place in my heart because it's the it's the chance I got. It was, a, you know, as I just said, an extraordinarily uh, fortunate timing that I'd done four years of building a show reel to the exact moment that the junior category became available. Uh, and because I've done that for 10 seasons now and some of the experiences, highs and lows in Formula 2, that's got a special place in my heart. But as you said, Tim, it, Formula 1 is the pinnacle. The stakes are the highest. It's where everyone who sits in a go-kart wants to be and therefore it feels the most important. And when sport feels like the stakes are that high, that's when, you know, you get these amazing stories. And that's why it, it will always be ultimately my favourite thing to call because it is the thing with the most on the line. Do you remember your first big commentary? And if you do, was it? alongside someone else was it on your own do you remember the emotions you were going through and and finally final part to that question do you remember how it was received by the fans i guess i guess it'd be interesting to talk about formula one here because that's the one that you know gets the most attention when anything happens you know social media blows up when a new voice comes in social media yeah. blows up but do you remember your your first time going going big yeah it was it wasn't ideal because we were still in the middle of the COVID protocols and one of the Channel 4 team came down with COVID. And bear in mind, as, as I told you earlier in the pod, I wanted to do this since I was 10 years old. So it's a big deal to be the lead commentator for Channel 4. Uh, and I had to do that commentary in Ealing whilst David Coulthard was in a sort of emergency setup. Uh, tech mode in Bahrain so we had to do a split commentary for the first commentary so rather you know it's not how you'd plan to do it um, and you know going in and replacing a commentator like Ben Edwards one of the very best of all time an extraordinary track record for for an incredible career whether it be on American single seaters whether it be on early Eurosport stuff like he'd been a such an authority for such a long time there was a bit of being daunted in there. Uh, the setup made it a bit strange. Uh, but the nature of Formula One races, Tim, is that you're straight on to the next one. So there almost wasn't even time to go, OK, uh, there, I would do that differently and that differently. And it's almost arranging your desk. OK, we're going to do that. And then you're straight into the next one. So uh, it was it was an incredible experience. Very nerve wracking to take that step up to, to Channel 4. But you very quickly get comfortable they've got an amazing team there and and before you know it you're uh, you're you're on to the next one and you cut your teeth prior to that in in various forms of racing how important were those sort of formative um, experiences to you when you made that jump into into f1 yeah hugely useful uh for a couple of reasons number one if you get to athletes when they're a little bit younger you can you can build more of a relationship they, they learn to trust you. The one thing with Formula 3 and Formula 2 is that there's one world feed, right? So when the drivers are reviewing races, whether they want to or not, with their team and they're in a debrief, uh, whether they want to or not, they're listening to what you say about them. So if you're fair with them, they hear that, they respond to that. And as we know, the motor racing paddock can be an incredibly brutal place. Opinions are flying around at a very early age. But at the time that you start commentating in the junior series, they're teenagers. And if we take Oscar Piastri, most recent Formula One race winner, as an example, he'd moved to the UK at 14 from Australia, left all of his friends behind, left all of his family behind. Then uh, his dad's got to go back for the rest of the family. So he's 15 years old in a boarding school in a country he doesn't know very well. And then almost... You know, months later, he's going to be hearing 
a paddock, talk about him, talk about him as a prospect, and talk about him trying to trying to move forward. So if you're slating those drivers at an early age, they hear about it, they remember. If you're if you're working with them, if you're glass half full, if you remind everyone it's a championship that uh, drivers are meant to make mistakes in, climbing the ladder, then I think they remember. So building a relationship with a driver and, and team personnel, very important in the junior racing uh, ladder. And then also it's just about getting experience. It's just about reps and constantly going through every scenario. And the nice thing about Formula 3 and Formula 2 is they did provide you with every single scenario possible, whether it's a bonkers finish under a virtual safety car, that you just, like, how on earth has that happened? And then you're trying to hang on to the coattails of it, or whether it's the safety guard being put out and not finding the right leader, like all things that have been through in the second and third tier um, that are very useful if it then happens in Formula One because you've been there and you've done that. Yeah, and and actually Formula Two, Formula Three, there's probably more going on on the track than there is in Formula One. So you're calling more stuff at the same time. So it's it's a great grounding. Now we've we've had the likes of Crofty on the show. We've had Harry Benjamin, Tom Brooks, Chris McCarthy, Will Buxton, who you mentioned earlier. Um, it's a very competitive space, the commentary world. How mm. can you make sure that you're ahead of the curve and you're the one that gets the phone call when when the next big thing is needed? It's a great question. Uh, I think the nature of it, it is hugely competitive. Let's make no mistake about it. Not just sports broadcasting, all broadcasting uh, on a, for a big gig, uh, for, a, for a main event is very, is very competitive. How you stay ahead of the curve is you realistically, a lot of it, well, you, you look at doing great original work. You look at trying to improve yourself as a broadcaster and develop your style your voice, what makes uh, you try and improve on your strengths, you try and bring up your weaknesses. But ultimately, the reality of that, that question, Tim, is that a lot of it is luck and timing. Sometimes you might not be the first phone call thought of, but if you go and do a great job for a production team, producers are incredibly busy people. You've got to, if you go in and do a great job, they're not going to second guess you. And if you can improve on that week in, week out, they're going to give you a chance again. So some of it is about looking at your own work and improving that constantly. And some of it is just luck and time. Now, I'd imagine with Formula One being what it is and motorsport commentary being what it is, it's, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, it's a high pressure environment. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area where you know there are millions and millions of people listening. Have there ever been moments where you've just thought, oh, God, I, I'm, I don't know what to say next. I've gone blank. I just want the commentary box to open up a hole in the floor and I just want to disappear. <laughs> there have been, I'd say more in the early, in like the F2 days. There was a, we had Damon Hill alongside David A. Valsecki and I this day and we'd had a really fun race. It was the George Russell, Lando Norris and Alex Alvin year for F2. So it's probably the best F2 year I've ever covered. And uh, I got a call in my ear. All right, Alex, wrap the show. And I was like, okay, uh, well, thank you so much. And I do my, you know, spiel for a minute. And they were like, oh, no, we've got to do, we've got to do something. Will Buxton's on the podium. He's going to interview someone on the podium. And I'm like, what? And anyways, they, they, you know, they go up to Will and Will does some sort of link on the podium. And they come back to me and we didn't normally do this. And they were like, all right, Alex, rap again. And I was like, I just have. I've said every, I've said everything conceivable there is to say about what we've just said. What, what we've just seen and I was like well and it was just like a giant um for such a long time and yeah you just you know you got the world champion in the comp box going what is going on kind of thing um so yeah that it's rare that it happens but yeah if 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 the if the running order doesn't go to plan sometimes you can be in a in a world of trouble a lot of the times if it's a non-serious red flag you're not under that much pressure and sometimes you can have some of the most fun in the commentary box filling time if there's like a, I don't know, if there's a, if there's a reason that the session can't get underway or there's, you know, if it's a serious red flag, it's a different story. But if it's a, if it's a, if it's a minor red flag, then you never normally run out of stuff to say. But when it's an unexpected running order change, yeah, that's the one that, that's the one that caught me out the most. And now there's been some legendary commentators over the years. Obviously, you know, I, I go back to Murray Walker, obviously he, the, the voice that so many people recognize as the voice of Formula One. And, you know, we've got Crofty now, but is, is there, is there anyone that you particularly take inspiration from either um, that's currently on the mic or, or perhaps someone from the past? Yeah, I think Murray Walker's, 
specifically Murray Walker's way of making it so accessible and so broad. Um, it all it struck me. It struck me at the time, and it strikes strikes me even more now that you know he created a broadcast that I could find by accident and get into as a ten year old. But he was also because of the nature of being on the BBC and then ITV. Um, was doing it for such a big audience that he was having to, so he was creating a commentary that a kid could understand. And he was creating an, a commentary that someone who'd watched every race since the beginning of the world championship could understand. And I, I, I think that making it as accessible to the broadest possible audience was, was probably the thing that I, I took most from him uh, in terms of make sure that it's not an insider's club, make sure that you're not saying, of course, Make sure that you're trying to explain everything for the new viewer. And we have so many new viewers in this in this post drive to survive and Formula One really expanding their digital offering age that that was the that was the thing that I was like, wow, that is that is an amazing. Art. And obviously, he'd been at the game a very long time by the point that I discovered his commentary. But that's the art of doing it. How many people can you bring along on the ride? And he had a very um, recognisable delivery, of course. How would you describe your style as a commentator? Uh, I I love it. I'm enthusiastic about it. Um, it's it's my favourite sport. It's always been my favourite sport. I love the competition of it. So I am excited and I am enthusiastic. And I'm trying to convey the high stakes nature of it. And ultimately, I think if... The commentator is having a good time and is passionate about the subject. I think the audience are going to have a good time and hopefully uh, feel the same way about it. So, yeah, I'm excited and I'm into it. And, uh, some, you know, sometimes you get you get a little bit of like, oh, why are they loud? Because racetracks are loud. Racetracks are an incredibly loud place to be. It's not the V10 engine anymore. But let me tell you, when you're you know, standing at the back of a grandstand and there's a V, you know, there's 20 V6 turbos going past. It's still incredibly noisy. So that's the, that's the high energy, high volume nature of, of motorsport broadcasting. Do you listen back and critique yourself? Do you go back, do you go back over the recordings and the highlights and go, ah, oh, bugger, I shouldn't have done that. That's something I need to change for next time. Uh, occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally. I think what can happen now in the in the social media age, Tim, is that people can get off air, get their phones out of their pockets and and form an opinion before they've looked at their work and critically formed an opinion themselves. And I always think it's really, really important to come off air and to go, right. I feel that that was this, you know, I thought it was either good or bad or whatever. So that's my opinion. And I'm going to pick through a little bit of the race and I don't do it every week because you go, you go mad. Uh, And there's, yeah. And and there's so many races that it's unrelenting, but there are also points where it's, for me, it's very important to go, all right, here's what I think before you then go and see potentially how some of the audience felt about it. Uh, And ultimately you've got to, as a commentator, stick to your guns, stick to your principles, uh, because you're the one trying to improve it every single week. And if you can get blown around in the wind, I think that that's when you try, if you end up trying to please everyone, I think you end up pleasing no one. So yeah, occasionally review it, go back through it and, and then see how the wider audience received it. Now you've been doing this for some time now. So I expect there's one or two moments that really stick in your mind. Is there, is there a few, um, moments that are particularly memorable to you perhaps a significant moment or uh, even an emotional moment that you've had to call um, on tv yeah so the the two that spring to mind when when you say significant and emotional the the significant one for me was getting to do the british grand prix for free to air tv for the first time channel four silverstone 2021 also coming out of the pandemic that was one of the first major sporting events in the uk since the lockdown restrictions were eased and it felt like Formula One was back. The crowd was enormous. The race was incredibly intense and an extraordinary spectacle. And it, yeah, it felt a it felt a big deal as part of the commentary journey that I'd been on. That's what I'd always wanted to do. We got an extraordinary spectacle as a race as well. The crowds were back. That one meant a lot to to do from for me and my family. And and ultimately, Tim, if you tell everyone that you want to be a commentator from the age of ten. And you get a chance to do it. You better be good. So there was a lot of there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of 
expectation on that one. And then to get an occasion like we did at Silverstone 2021, that's the that's the race commentary that means uh, the, the most to me. Um, I think from a from a career point of view, and the most emotional was was Monza 2019 after we'd lost Antoine Hubert the, the week before. One of the most horrendous accidents we've seen in modern times. Everyone was numb from what had happened. You got to Monza and it was real. Uh, there was a you know an empty space in the in the awnings where the, his car should have been worked on, and uh, that's certainly the most raw commentary I've ever done. Certainly the most honest and direct. Um, commentary I've ever done to to an audience, and I hope I'd never have to go through anything like that. But you have again, but you have a responsibility to your broadcast team and and to the championship ultimately at, at that point to to keep everyone going and and to and to take them from a horrendous event to to what was on track. So um, yeah, that was by far the most emotional. Though. So when you're in the commentary box, um, and when we're listening at home, we hear you talking over a race. Um, with pitches. I think very few people really appreciate the challenges that go on in a commentary box. It, you know, you, you, th- thanks to social media now, we can see some behind the scenes bits and pieces. And I know that you've shared a few things as of some other commentators of all the different screens and bits and pieces and bobs, of, you know, things that are happening while the race is going on. Can you try and describe some of the challenges that you have as a commentator in terms of, you know, people in your ear, directors, producers, different screens to look at, making sure you're calling the right driver at the right time? It's not straightforward, is it? No, I think that's half the fun of it is I think the challenge is is a lot of fun. Um, it isn't straightforward. I think very early on you work with, I think people... Uh, listening to this might be like, okay, multiple voices in your ear all the way through, but you do get into a working rhythm with your producers. So that one isn't a problem once you get into a working rhythm of what you need, what they need. Um, for me, it's the, it's the first lap of the race. That is unrehearsable. Uh, you, you have at least 20 drivers going in every different direction you in formula two this week we had a driver go from fifth on the grid to the lead uh we had all the cars spraying all over the road at the start of the grand prix in budapest that is for me the greatest challenge that you will face as a as a motor racing commentator and then when it goes well gives you a massive buzz and when it's gone badly and sometimes it can go sometimes it can just go completely wrong um then there's a couple of laps where you're like, oh, I wish I could have that again. And then you're back into the rhythm of the race. But yeah, it's the, fir- it's the first lap. There are lots of challenges. Uh, you're always going to ID a car wrong at some point. That's just the nature of live TV. Um, but the, the main challenge, the main challenge by far is the first lap. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, you don't have to do this alone. Usually, more often than not, there's someone alongside you, although I've heard a lot of your commentaries where you're actually commentating on your own, which must be a challenge all of its own. But if you could pick, I'm going to put you on the spot here, if you could pick your ideal co-commentator to go alongside, <laughs> be, it, be it present day or past, who would it be? Are you trying to get me in trouble now, Tim? Uh, I've, I've been very lucky with i've worked with some amazing co-commentators like some you know just an incredible array of people that i've got to work with and i actually think that's where i've kind of been the luckiest in that if you look at the people i've worked alongside just some amazing there and i'm not going to go through them because i i will leave someone out and then that person will text me saying oh i wasn't good enough for you and and it all falls apart Tim. so i don't want to do that the one so uh it would have been amazing to commentate with james hunt I mean, very no nonsense. That would have been amazing from the past. Uh, I don't know. Although having read Murray Walker's autobiography, I don't know how it would feel to commentate with a uh, uh, a guy who brought a bottle of wine into the box in 2024. I'd be a lot of fun, I imagine. Uh, I think looking ahead, I think Daniel Ricciardo would be incredibly good at co-commentary whenever he finishes. And, and also I get the feeling George Russell might, might have the chops for it. I mean, sometimes when he's he's pressing the team radio button, you're like, hey, you feel like the third, fourth commentator in the booth here, George. He's like almost chiming in as the race goes. So I think he's got a career in it afterwards if he fancies it. Um, so they'd be the they'd be the ones in the future, I think, who would uh, would add something to a commentary. You've done an expert job there, and not mentioning any of your, uh, your <laughs> colleagues there. They're well done. I, I, I love the idea. I love the idea of uh, Danny Rick in the commentary box. Now, um, before we come on to our final three, just a, an interesting one that I wanted to fire at you just for, for some quick fire answers. Um, 
you've been to a number of races now. Um, favorite races to attend from the perspective of simply having a laugh, having fun, whether it's at the track, away from the track, just having good fun. Which one would it be? I think Australia is a, is a wonderful event for that. Uh, food's good, coffee's good, beer's good, wine's good. That's a nice combination. City's fantastic. Um, it's quite a walkable city as well. So sometimes you have, you have a late finish, but the weather's beautiful. You can walk to a, to a location on the river. Um, so I think as an all-round event and what's on offer there, I, I think, yeah, uh, Australia is probably my pick for number one. Very good. Little hat tip to, to the Aussies there. Um, best for on-track action? I love Monza for on-track action. Uh, looking at it as a whole weekend, Formula 3 is a, is a brawl. Uh, it's the craziest that championship gets all season long. Formula 2, great races that always go to the end. And Formula 1, it, it, because of the Ferrari element and because of the crowd and the atmosphere, it really does feel like it really feels on edge and important. And there's a, there's a passion and an atmosphere there that that is always my favourite build up to a Grand Prix, no matter what type of race we get. So probably Monza. Nice one. And for sheer paddock chaos and <laughs> rumours, gossip, famous faces, which one would you pick? Oh, famous faces. You're always going to be looking at Miami these days. But I think overall for everything you described... I think the paddock shenanigans of Mexico are for so many reasons. So stories, everyone's getting tired and irritable by the end of the year because it's a, it's a very long calendar. So a lot of stories are swirling around by Mexico. There's a big attendance and passion at that race. There's a lot of people in that paddock. But they also have things like a barbers. They have food stalls. They have drink stands. It's a, it's a whole mini town in the paddock compared to what you normally get. So uh, I, I very much enjoy where Formula One's at by the time we get to the Mexican Grand Prix. Very good. Now I'm going to move on to our final three questions, which are brought to us by our friends and sponsors, F1 Experiences. First one for you, and this could be anything, doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to be motorsport related. What's got you excited at the moment? Uh, having, a, having a holiday in a few weeks. That's, that's going to be nice. Seeing, seeing actual friends and family. And, uh, and hanging out with people that I haven't seen since March is going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, outside of motor racing. But, yeah, I mean, the obvious and boring one to say is like the season that we're having because it turned around. But in all honesty, I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to seeing friends and family. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. Um, the August break is very welcome for a lot of people in Formula One. I've actually just got back from my holiday. I had a two week holiday in Turkey, which I got back from about um, three hours ago uh, with uh, no sleep on an overnight flight. So. I already can't remember what I said five minutes ago, so we'll see how this goes in the edit. It's going very um, well, Second Tim. one You'd for you, Alex. Know. You'd What's never know. one lesson that your job? <laughs> What's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everybody should learn at some point in their life? I'd say that the highs are never as high, and the lows are never as low, and that people I've seen be successful in broadcasting and in sport not just Formula One, but in sport in general, are able to, to minimise that, to package that, and to basically just trundle along being uh, optimistic, but not too high and not too low. And I think if you can do that, that leads to a consistency uh, that defines who, who gets to stay at the top, basically. Excellent. Very, very good advice. Final question for you. What's one thing that nobody really knows about you? Uh, we'll bring it back to the start. I don't think many people knew I was an Ipswich fan uh before may uh because we hadn't had a lot to shout about and uh i kind of like people aren't following me on social media for football chat so i kind of kept that quiet and now everyone knows i'm an itch fan so i'm not sure what the answer to that question is anymore uh i'm genuinely not sure uh uh any someone knows about me i don't i don't know tim i don't know what what are some of the other answers that you get at this point of the pod um we we've had a few different things you know people who for example um uh, have a hidden talent as a you know i mean will buxton would be a great one because he's good at bloody everything you know he's he can draw he's a great artist he can sing he can you know he can play instruments you know 
it's really annoying. He's just one of those blokes that's good at everything. But we, we've had a myriad of different answers. But look, I'll, I'll take I'll take that up until the beginning of this year, no one knew you were an Ipswich <laughs> fan. And now we clearly do. And that your best mates with Ed Sheeran, and, you know, name dropping all over the place. We'll take that. But look, Alex, it's been fantastic having you on the show. We wanted to have you, have you on for ages. So it's great to finally get the opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, come on anytime. You're always more than welcome. Um, enjoy your break in August when it finally comes around. But for now, thank you so much for joining us on the Motor Mouth Podcast. Thanks for having me. Great to speak to you, Tim.